Welcome to the Data Friday. My name is Vagar Schimke. I'm the CEO of Scafery. We run a session here every Friday, 11 o'clock uh, Central European Standard Time, to allow you, the audience, asking to ask questions essentially about data vault, data vault we know, um, data driven solutions, cloud computing, anything data driven is, is great. You can use um, the client here. If you have a question, just raise them here in the chat. Use the QA in the client here. Raise your hand if you want to have voice. Don't misuse that, right? Um, but uh, you can also use a form, which I'll show you afterwards. After today's session, essentially, I show you the link where you can uh, log in and type in your question and upload maybe some images if you want. Um, if you receive, and we have at the moment multiple questions, um, I would cherry pick out of the, uh, the pool of questions, essentially. And um, typically, it's time box. So we're looking at a question roughly 10, 15 minutes, which is good for, for a video uh, online, right? Um, if there would be no questions at all, I would talk about the cluster. Last summer, we did, actually, because there was a summer break where we didn't have any question. And then I could talk and show something on the on the screen, actually. Well, summer is coming up, and we have a couple of questions here. So we'll see if it works out this, this time again. Um, all right. There's one question, actually, which um, is lingering around in my pool for quite a while. And that was on Databricks. And I didn't pick it up for a reason, because um, essentially, we are, it, some of you know already, we are writing a block series as Microsoft at the moment. And um, article number four just came out, and that's on Databricks. And that's why I was waiting for this question to discuss. So it's produced the video for the article, more or less. Um, yeah, let me share my screen here. And you see the link as well. So the question is essentially, um, well, there was some discussion essentially on LinkedIn um, if Data Vault works on Databricks or not. And there was lots of comments why it doesn't work and so on. And um, in some of these, I mean, these comments are, are to some extent valid, uh, lots of joints, for example, the performance of getting data out and so on. Um, well, there's some comments here not suited for modern automation. Okay. Um, but yeah, let's, let's discuss Databricks. And if you're interested in Databricks on, and how Data Vault works on Databricks, Check out the article here behind that link. Uh, if you go for sfr.ee slash Databricks, I made you a readable, nice readable link uh, that points you essentially to the uh, Microsoft industry blog in Canada for whatever reason. And that's where we publish the article with Volspeed together. That's where I find a more in-depth discussion. I want to keep it short. I want to give you the brief, um, a good video essentially for sharing as well. Um, so here's the thing, on any, data uh, on any Hadoop uh, installation, uh, be it Cloudera, be it Databricks, and so on. On those installations, um, well, to be honest, in every data warehouse or data analytics application, you receive data from a source system, right? So in the source system delivers you the data. And what we do in, in a, in a data world approach is when we stage data via a data lake, also via relation engine, doesn't matter. When we stage data via a data lake, we keep the data in the structure as it's being delivered. That's number one. So you get all these source systems from your, uh, all these, the source data from your source systems, and they end up on the data lake somewhere in the data lake, for example. The data is in the source data set, in the source structure of the, of the source system. And I would personally, I would, I would uh, essentially reduce the effort of how I'm treating this incoming data as low as possible. So I don't want to spend much time, much effort on ingesting the data. I just get the data into my data lake, that's it. Now you're facing a problem because your information user comes in and says, you know what, I would like to get some information. That's problem number one. Problem number two is they will decide or define the target structure for the information independently from the source data set. So they come up with some star schemas, some flat and white structures, whatever it is, but it's often, sometimes, but often it's not in the source data set. There are some scenarios where you also deliver the source data as is, or the information in a, a very similar or even exactly as in the source data set, like we call this a source mod, but it's another story. So they will define an independent structure for the information. And now you have a problem because on one side, on the incoming side, you have the, um, the, the incoming data in the source structure. And on the outgoing side, you have to deliver information in a, a different independent information structure. And there's a gap in between, right? And now we were talking about Databricks because that problem we have all the time in Data Vault, right? Um, and the idea now is that, I mean, there's a couple of I uh, ideas or concepts how you could solve this problem, even independently from Data Vault. So you got a source data set, you got outgoing information, data, uh, information structure, just wrangle the data, right? Just wrangle it and, and get the data from A to B, essentially. That's it, one option. No concept at all, just, just make it fit. That's option number one. The other thing is, 
if we go the more datable approach, if you would tell me what are the business keys in your data set, in your source data sets, where are the business keys, where are the um, uh, uh, relationships, and where is the descriptive data in your data set? Because in, in our trainings, I always say all your data contains those three fundamental uh, components of data, all your data, even the data on the data, data lake. All right. So if you can identify those elements, those fundamental components of your data, I could turn that or could use that information to turn your incoming source model into anything you want. Because I know all the patterns, right? And you know them as well. So the, um, I mean, how we turn a, well, how we load the business key into a hub and then turn the hub and its satellite into a dimension, for example. This, this is a standard pattern, essentially. But I need to know the business keys, the relationships, and the um, descriptive data, right? That's the basic idea. So that's number one. So let's talk about the concept of data vault. And um, the, what I would do is, is this. I would use a data model in between. So in the, in the, uh, in the, on the gap, essentially, right? From your source data to information model. I would use a data vault, data vault model, but I would, the, the problem is this. The Delta Lake stores um, the data in parquet files, and parquet files are column-based. And that leads to some, to some design decisions now, because we know that column-based storage, for example, parquet files, is great for aggregations. That's awesome. But then it has a problem with joining data because and it, it's not because of parquet files, but really because of the underlying storage, the column-based storage. That's a problem. Um, it's, it's just bad to join data, but great to aggregate data. So with that in mind, let's talk about the, the information mart first. Let's define the target model, the preferred target model. If I know that join is bad and aggregation is fast, it's a great format actually for the information mart, right? But I would not use a star schema. Um, we discussed this in an article. To some extent, it works. But um, from our previous projects, I prefer a flat and white structure. Just flat and white structures to prevent the join at all costs. Well, yeah, it, it means redundancy, which I can compress. So yes, I pay the price with redundant data, but I prevent the joins. And that's extremely fast. So I, I like the typically when I have to trade between storage and performance, I go for performance, to be honest. Um, that's extremely fast because I got rid of all the joints. All right. That's number one. So the information model from my perspective is clear. Just flat and white structures, prevent all the joints, no star schemas, just fully denormalize all the dimensional attributes into your fact entities. That's it. Let's talk about the data vault model. First of all, um, oh, sorry, one more comment on the information mart. The information mart is fully materialized. All right. So I don't virtualize there because um, the virtualization would then again resolve in joints and so on. So if I have a flat and white structure from information mart, then I can have the highest performance for the end users. And that's what I query, right? So that's, that's where I want to achieve the performance. And now the data will become a tool to turn the source data set into flat and white parquet files, which are fully materialized. That's your job. That's the job for a data vault here. So we identify just as in, in, in different projects on different technology stacks, we identify the fundamental components, business keys, relationships, and descriptive data, turn it into a data model. But because of the joint performance, and, and the, the, the data model is materialized anywhere, right? So, but because of the joint performance, I would prevent or I would try to, avoid, to reduce the number of satellite splits. For example, um, we typically have satellite splits for rate of change if it's not compressed. We can compress. So I would not do a rate of change split. I would still split by source system because data is independently delivered. I would, and then, yeah, the next splits are typically uh, security and privacy. Now, security, we can also apply differently to some extent. First of all, we could use um, Databricks technologies to apply security on the data itself. And then um, we could also, when we create a view layer on top of the raw data vault, we could, instead of splitting the satellites, we create different views to um, uh, and, and um, uh, 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 grant access to those views instead of the satellite tables. That's number one. So the security split is not required, to be honest. The problem is the privacy split, but um, uh, the Delta Lake has provisions for that as well to have point deletes in, in files. So you could essentially avoid the satellite split for privacy as well. Gives you one satellite per business key per uh, per hub and per um, source system essentially roughly. That's it. 
So try to reduce the number of joints. But here's the thing. Here's, here's the thing. It doesn't really matter because in the end, if the target is materialized, we're just using the data world as a tool to identify the, the business keys, relationships, and discrete data and turn that into a, a flat and white structure, right? So into, your, into any target model. So we just use it as a tool to organize our data streams now, our data flows on the, da on the data lake to, to create these information model entities. So, but first thing is, I would use a um, raw data vault to clearly identify the fundamental components of my data and organize the data flows accordingly. For the business vault, I would typically virtualize as much as possible because the performance doesn't really matter because my targets are materialized so and flat and white. So I would just use virtual business vault structures to apply the business rules to transform the data and then use that maybe with PAT tables for convenience because we know the patterns, how to derive a, a dimension once a PAT table is involved. Maybe I have bridge tables to leverage uh, or reuse grain shifts, for example. So I can use all these tools we know, but then I use those components in the raw data vault, in the business vault, to turn it into an information mart, into a flat and white information mart. And that, runs, that works like a charm. So the, the argument here, there are lots of joins, performance getting data out. That's just a design choice. It depends on how you design the data vault on Databricks. That's it. The auto, modern automation, I mean, I'm, I've seen systems um, with a lot of automation. Um, yeah, that's what, all, all I can say, but it's a lot of automation. So the, um, I mean, even more what you know at the moment, but um, there's, um, that's, that's not an argument. So the generating, the, 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 the letter ties to tools, creating generated code per object versus parameterized pipelines, you can do both with Data Vault. You can have pipelines parameterized that push the data into your raw data vault or apply business logic downstream or generating code per object, both will work. So that's, that's an argument as well. At least those three we can deal with. And yes, Data Vault works like a charm on Databricks. That's not the point. It's just a design choice how you apply these concepts, these patterns from Data Vault on your tool stack, on Databricks in this case, or on other tool stacks. And column based versus row based has some implications, right? That's, that's the only thing. Um, all right. That's my comment on Databricks. Check out the article on the Microsoft blog uh, behind sfr.ee slash Databricks. I will post the link in the description as well. And, or well, not me, but our team. And um, yeah, good question. Sorry for um, having it around that long, but um, yeah, keep posting guys. Okay, cool. So thanks for joining today. Uh, happy reading and see you next Friday. Have a nice weekend, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining today. If you'd like to discuss this further, give us a call on, on the number below here and we have to discuss this with you. See you next time. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.